Uh, welcome to our, uh, the first talk of our seminar series. Uh, so we are very pleased to have uh, Professor Mete Sonar from Princeton University with us. Uh, he is, um, he's been at Princeton since 2019. Uh, prior to that, he was at ETHA uh, and, um, and actually uh, Koch University and Sabanj University in Turkey. And, and prior to that, he was in uh, Princeton and Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he is very well known in so, uh, stochastic control and viscosity solutions. Uh, he he has this uh, beautiful book on uh, so, stochastic control with Vandell Fleming, and authored many uh, articles on partial differential equations and viscosity solutions. Currently, he is the editor in chief, chief of SIAM Journal of Financial Mathematics, um, and uh, is an important contributor uh, to that field. So, uh, without further ado. I'll uh, leave this into Mete. Okay. <laughs> the, just a second. I mean, my computer doesn't want to continue. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Erhan. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the for the invitation to give this uh, talk. Of course, it is very special to me. Uh, I've been to many places in, in uh, but in particular, also a couple places in. In Istanbul and also Boazic University, I was a uh, I was a student and also a visitor at some point in my in my career. So today, what I will talk about is is a uh, is a topic that I've been involved from, from since since graduate school. And when I was thinking about this talk, this is a colloquium talk, so I need to I need to have to have a goal. What am I supposed to convey to you? And I decided that I will just describe what optimal control is and what it can do for you and what it has been able to do up until now. So, but because of that, I want this to be, to be understood by everybody. So I'm not going to get into very high, uh, highly technical mathematical structures. So from the beginning, I want to warn you about that. And also, uh, I hope that you don't think that there is no deep and involved mathematics in this field. It's just that it is not I, I just chose to tell you what it is and how useful it is. And if you want to learn more about it, there are many, many uh, sources that you can use. So that is what I would like to do today. Uh, so the, having said that, I'm sorry, this is going to happen apparently. It doesn't see my uh, face either. So sorry about that. Uh, at least it's a beautiful uh, mountain picture. So let me just uh, give credit to my teachers to start with. So. Okay, how is that going to move? It's not moving either. So, okay. So I have two two uh, really important uh, teachers in my career. So I want to mention that first. Uh, first of them is Wendell Fleming. He was my PhD advisor at, at Brown University. We have co-authored a book with uh, together after that. And I have learned a lot of things from him and also the kind of mathematics you uh, he does. And I kind of, uh, you always take your supervisor's style and that is an important style that I have developed uh, thanks to him. And also Ali Ulgar was my uh, teacher in 1980, I believe. Uh, this was after the military takeover in Istanbul, so we had nothing to do but uh, do mathematics. And he taught us uh, mathematical analysis and I've been using that since then. So I would like to thank him again to Ali Ulgar for, for uh, wonderful courses that he has taught to me and to many others at Boazici. And I have the, this talk also uh, due to many collaborations over the years and the numbers, uh, number of people over there. And I have collaborated even more pe people, uh, but let me just at least indicate a number of them. And uh, these, these people are some number of them are older than me. Some of them are my students and, and it's, a, it's, a, uh, it is, it's a generational thing. And it's the, what I like about mathematics as well. So you work with uh, people from everywhere and at all ages. And this is a small subgroup of what uh, those who, who work with me. So having said all these things, so let me tell you what I'm trying to do. Uh, what, what we're trying to do in optimal control more uh, specific. So uh, optimal control has a lot of uses. One of them is in social sciences, in particular in, in, in economics. Uh, it has become an important, extremely central uh, math, uh, modeling tool. So what they think is that people uh, make decisions rationally, 
And if they are rational, they're there to solving some kind of an optimization problem. And, and that is an axiom. I mean, it is not that, oh, I rather like to do that and all these things. So this is how they model uh, people's behavior. And there could be a game theoretic aspect to it. Uh, but even if it's a game theoretic aspect, in describing a game, the differential game uh, type of a model, there is an optimal control uh, part to it. So in social sciences, it is used in this way in most of the time that you assume that people or uh, companies or corporations are acting rationally. And that means that they are solving some kind of an optimal control problem. Even, even themselves may not know that they are doing it, but that is how we model them. So that has been very useful. This is modern mathematics. Many uh, aspects are using that. In engineering at the very beginning, we were trying to do really optimally. I'm a double E major from uh, Boazici way back when. So that was, we were trying to do things optimally because there were these resources were scarce and you want to use them as effectively as possible. But things got better over the years. So you didn't, we don't care much about optimality. We rather care about robustness, feasibility, and all these things. But still, if you can do optimal, they generally it generally has these uh, features as well. And more recently, modern uh, learning methods are using a lot of the algorithms that has been developed uh, over the years, over the decades in optimal control. So that is what optimal control is doing in social sciences. It's a really a nice tool, how to quantify things that are highly difficult to quantify. In engineering, it helps you to develop robust things. And in learning, it is really central uh, to where everything starts. So in that sense, uh, this is, uh, again, I said, okay. So, so what is new? I mean, that is what I told you is <laughs> the old stuff. So I have to tell you something new as well. It's an old theory, it has done, done we're over with it. It is, parts of it is done and extremely mature, but uh, remarkably every, every year we find new applications. So let me mention two applications that people are really working uh, very actively these days. One of them is mean field games. This is a, I like this uh, cartoon, the over here, I should, uh, let's see how we do it. This is Pierre Lyons. Uh, and this is, for example, Cardelegue. Uh, and many other people are working on this thing. This is a very, very active field. And this picture right over here, it just kind of tells you what they're after. They're trying to find or model uh, collective behavior in, in many social uh, 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 applications from social sciences. So it has a, uh, it has a model in tool which has really uh, very uh, high potential and that's been used, uh, it's been actively studied and a number of us are involved in it. That is one field. Oops, I'm sorry about that. Oops. <clears throat> okay, so I'm not used to that anymore. So, so the other things in reinforcement learning or modern learning techniques, this is a cartoon which shows that the optimal control really sits in the middle of these techniques. You may not see optimal control being mathematically developed over here, but what we have developed is being used. And, and it, it gives you the ideas or that people are using ideas from these old theories. So there are a lot of new things. That's what I'm trying to convince you. But so having said that, I'm going to go back really uh, first thousands of, uh, not thousands, but several hundred years back, and then several decades back and tell you what optimal control is. And, uh, and I will do that through number of applications. So the very first problem is the, the Brachistrom, uh, uh, Brachistochrome problem. And that is, that is this problem. Okay, this is not very visible. Uh, you have two points, one is here, one is there. And uh, Newton was challenged to solve this problem. Like it says over here, 1696, and he solved it the next day. So it cannot be, uh, well, it took him a day at least, cannot be that easy. Uh, so you, what you want to do is you want to find the uh, best trajectory that takes you from this place up to down. Of course, if we all kind of, I mean, we're all mathematicians, we're going to know that this is not going to be the straight line from here to there. I mean, this is not going to work. That's clear. Uh, and so this is exactly the problem that I'm showing you. 
and then the straight curve is not going to uh, work. And what we're thinking is the following. You can do it at home yourself as well. You take a point here, another point there, and a piece of uh, wire and the bead which has a hole in it. But you don't want friction. You just leave it there and it just slides down. So you want to do this as fast as possible without friction. And this is done by gravity alone. And this the, the straight line is definitely not because you want to you want to speed up fast at the beginning. So you want to go like this because it gives you a little bit initial speed fast and that, that is useful. And in fact, the solution is like that. The green curve is the solution. And there is a very, I mean, you can just type Prehistome uh, Scrum in, in Google, you find the solution everywhere. So, and then for example, this Wolfram has a demonstration uh, page to it. You can see what it is, what the solution is. Uh, and <clears throat> there are, you can even go, you can go further down and go uphill. There are very, uh, some are interesting things, but once you do the calculation, they become normal to you. So the point that I was trying to make over here is, this is the first recorded optimal control problem in history. Before that, there were a lot of problems in, in classical mechanics, which can be thought of as optimal control problems. But here, the control is active. In, in classical mechanics, the, the law of uh, motion is given to you by, by, by physics. Here, you get to choose one thing. And that is what you choose over here is really this angle over here. Theta over here is up to you to choose, and you want to choose this so as to minimize the travel time. So a couple of things that are used in, in optimal control are apparent in this page. That's why uh, I want to spend a little bit of time. So there is something called the state in the, in, in, in the optimal control problems. So there has to be, this is generally a function of time because it is evolving in time. The state has to describe what you want to describe here. You want, to, you want to know the position of the beat. So this is the position of the beat. You really want to know that. And, and from physics, we know that if you want to describe motion, you need to know the speed as well because uh, law of motion or Newton's law says that you need to know X, I'm sorry. So we need to know X and the speed. So the pair X and V is my state. And then what you do is, the, the, you decide what the control is and control as we decided before is the angle, right? I mean, so you choose, you're going to choose that one. Nobody's giving you that. When you, when you place the wire from connecting to here, you essentially telling what the, what the angle is. And if you know the angle, uh, the equations of motion are written like this. I may have even made a mistake, but the point is you can write it uh, by using just simple physics, right? And here, G is the gravitational constant. And apart from that, everything is uh, just, uh, just simple physics. Now, so the notions that I want to uh, introduce here to you are, are the state uh, process. Here is, is the pair X and V, location and the speed. And the other is the notion of control. Once control is a function of time is given to you, you can describe, you should be able to describe the motion of the uh, state. So X over here is the X and V are the state. I tell you what theta is, you can just tell me what X T and V T are given the initial condition. And then your goal is to choose theta so as to minimize the travel time. Travel time can be described through the state because if I know the state, I know how much time it took me to get there. Again, I'm sorry about this, but this is gonna be, uh, nope. Uh, okay, so, so this is the first application. This goes a couple years back, uh, 400 years back uh, about. So that's, that, is, that is solved very easily. There is nothing stochastic about it. There's a deterministic problem. Since then, I mean, optimal control and classical mechanics were kind of combined with each other. Uh, so there was a lot of, of course, uh, development in uh, calculus of variations and that, that was also had implications in optimal control. But the true application of optimal control came in the uh, moon project in the 50s. They were trying to send the people up to moon. So they had to do things very, very efficiently. I don't know if you've seen the movies about it, but 
At that time, there were no calculators. They were using slide rulers. So everything had to be really, really efficient because of that optimal control played an essential role in that project. So I'm going to show you one uh, thing about, uh, this is <laughs> annoying me as well. Uh, okay, uh, lunar uh, landing problem. So th th I'm going to take the whole project at a lot of optimal control applications. This is one particular one. This is, uh, you remember they go up around the moon, they are turning around the moon and then at some point they split and the small part of the uh, spacecraft lands on the moon. So this is the problem that they try to solve and they try to do this thing as efficiently as possible because uh, efficient man that uh, you, you don't need as much uh, fuel in the, in the uh, you didn't use as much fuel. So that was very important. So the, pr uh, the point over here is, hmm. Okay, so what you do is that the first thing is that you have to decide, decide what your uh, state is. Your state is going to be the location of your uh, vehicle. And let's see, I mean, you have R, theta, I don't even remember, I copied these things. And one, for example, one state variable over here is M. M is the mass. So in many applications, mass is not a state variable because mass stays constant, but here it is important because as you burn fuel, mass uh, mass decreases and it has implications. So they were really very detailed and there are some controls because you just shoot out, you burn, uh, you burn some kind of uh, fuel and that pushes in certain directions. So this trust of the magnitude of the trust, the amount of fuel that you burn away and is, is T and trust angles in which direction you send this uh, trust are your control variables. So they were trying to, they're going to compute this thing offline before they send it off. And that's going to be implemented as they were landing on. And, uh, and then they reduced the equations, uh, uh, thinking that number of them are, uh, are not so relevant in the calculations, but they, keep, they kept the mass, right? I mean, it's not that they kept, they didn't keep the others. The radius over here is kept and the velocity and all these things. So, now, they are, uh, the reason that they, they reduced the uh, equations at that time was they were not able to solve very high dimensional problems. This is already a very high dimensional problem in the 1950s, five dimensions. So eventually what they do is that they solve this problem and they try to minimize the uh, fuel or they minimize the, uh, the, 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 the time to land. So those are the things that they did. They really solved this problem. They hard coded this one into the lunar uh, landing module and, and it worked. I mean, that was, that was important and they had to be uh, optimal. So that's, that initiated this project of lunar uh, or moon landing problems or generally the moon problem has initiated optimal control. And that is the start of the field. And it started very actively both in the United States and Soviet Union. And because of the competition, it got really uh, very fascinating results were obtained in the 60s and 70s. What is the problem? So let me just uh, describe it a little bit more uh, technically. So X is going to be as opposed to X was the position of the beat before, but X right now is the whole state. So I have a, a state uh, a state over here, XT. I, I, I didn't write it here, so let me write this. XT, X alpha is the state. And the, 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 the point uh, X over here means that initially it is equal to X and alpha up there tells me that I'm using the control alpha. Alpha is not constant, it's a function. Now, then the dynamics, in a, this is a deterministic optimal control problem. There is no stochasticity. The dynamics is well known as in the lunar landing problem. So you write down this equation as a nonlinear function of the state and the control. It is non-linear non in both applications I show you. It's highly non-linear, in fact. And then, the, then you want to do something with your control alpha. What do you do? Uh, in, uh, there are many objectives you can have. The one that I choose over here, and it's a choice. There could be other choices. And uh, I want to minimize the time 
it takes for me to reach a point. In both applications, it was the same, uh, this type of a, a function, uh, objective. In the problem of Newton, it was really trying to get to a point from A to B, you wanted to hit there. And the moon landing problem, you want, to do, uh, you want to reach the face of the moon, maybe you want to go to a specific place in the moon as well. I don't, I don't remember that they tried to go to a specific place. So this is this is mathematical formulation of the problem. It's well defined, and it has a lot of applications in robotics, in fact, even to this day. And let's see how uh, what what this is one problem. I mean, so I'm trying to tell you what the problem uh, problems look like. So the another class of problems which are extremely important in engineering, in particular, are called optimal regulators, and that has a very simple structure. You remember. I was taking here x, the dynamics of x to be a nonlinear function of state and, and the control. Now, in the linear regulators, you check that function to be a, you see here, before I was writing f of x and alpha, now it's a linear function of x and a linear function of alpha. So it is, is a joint function of alpha and x, it is linear. You may say that it is too much of a simplification. And I tell you that, in fact, that is a very, rather very, reasonable thing to do in this particular context. And then instead of, instead of minimizing the time it takes to go somewhere, here you minimize a quadratic function of uh, the state and the quadratic function of the control. Now, M and N over there are some, some uh, matrices. Uh, we can take them to be identity, but most of the time, the, the dimensional uh, considerations tells me that I want to do something uh, other than the, the, the identity matrix. But that is not a big thing. So these are really uh, square of X and square of alpha. And the application over here is you're trying to follow a trajectory. Uh, so X over here, you state is the deviations from the trajectory you want to follow. One application, it's not written over here, is uh, the, the autopilots in when when the plane is uh, cruising in the in the uh, in the cruising altitude. So when it's flying in the cruising altitude, uh, what 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 it is done over there is that uh, the machine, the plane, is given a trajectory, but it makes measurements once in a while, not continuously, quite continuously, but not all the time. So it, you can deviate from this trajectory. You measure it, you know it, and by control, you want to keep it very close to this uh, trajectory that is uh, computed prior uh, at the beginning of the application. So that is a very typical application of a linear quadratic regulator, but there are many others, but autopilot is definitely still to this day is being used. Uh, there is one the difference. Generally you put a plus, uh, you would put a noise over here because uh, there is wind and many other things that are not quite known to you a priori. So, and why do, you, why do you choose this quadratic cost over here? I'm trying to minimize deviations so you could put an absolute value of X. X is the error from between your actual position of the plane and the trajectory. Absolute value would do the job, but this is an engineering application. You just choose something which is convenient and square is always convenient in an optimization problem because it's differentiable, right? And that is, and you, the, the, the square alpha term over here is that you want to do this, uh, following the trajectory without too much interference, right? I mean, you don't want to autopilot always jiggling the uh, airplane. You, it, it should use control whenever uh, as little as possible. So quadratic, again, makes sure that it is done that way. There could be other choices from, from a modeling point of view, but this is what was chosen in the linear quadratic regulators and it works very well, uh, so they didn't change. There is no need to change these controls. So let me tell you one thing, why, why linear? So as I said, before, before this thing was F, this was a function F before, F of xt and alpha t, and now I took it to be linear. Why? Uh, so this is, this is the original thing. But X is going to be, in this application, linear quadratic regulator applications, 
x is always a deviation, some kind of an error. An error is by, you want the error to be small. So if it is small, you can just take Taylor expansions. So, and, and, and if you need both the state x and the control alpha to be small, but if deviations are small, your controls are gonna be small as well. Think about the autopilot, to keep it all in the correct trajectory, you're not going to make too much, too big of uh, uh, interference with the, with the flight. So it's gonna be small. So what you do is that if alpha and, and X are small, you do, you do a first order approximation right here. And, and that gives a linear, uh, linear function. So in that sense, as a mathematician, my, my tendency, I have always done uh, nonlinear uh, uh, optimal control. But in this particular example, I think nonlinearity would be too much. There's no need for it. So these are the applications uh, and the solution over here. So let me go over this one. The solution, you kind of know that the uh, things scale linearly in directions. So you can find a quadratic solution to it. And there is an explicit solution obtained by Riccati equations. So that is important that there are Riccati equations that show up in other parts of physics that shows up here. And in the old days, it was not easy to solve. Nowadays, you just write one line in a Python. It just tells you what the solution is. So it is, it is known and it is given as in a feedback form in the sense that all I need to know is my position. If I know the position, my control is always the same. And uh, so this is a rare application. I should say that it rare uh, explicit solutions are rare and they can be calculated offline. And because of that, it has a lot of applications. And let me show you one picture over here. So what you do in this thing is that if there is noise and if things are not completely uh, observable, which is not something that I have mentioned at all in the, in the previous slides, but that is the application of flight mode, you don't really, measure everything. You just maybe measure the altitude and the direction, but not much more. And from that, you want to, you want to estimate what other things, uh, what other important uh, parameters are. And then using that information, you do a linear quadratic regulator, you apply and uh, you apply that to the plane and then uh, continue like that. So what happens over here is that you observe something right here. So this is, let's say that you're observing the altitude and the, uh, what else could it be? Altitude and, and the, maybe the, the direction of the, of the plane. So this is your Y. And then you just tell the machine that, look, I have observed Y. So he wants to know, the, the machine wants to know more about the state, maybe wants to know uh, maybe the rotation of the plane and many other things. And then does a Kalman filter to it. And then once it has the Kalman filter, then there is a control that through uh, the Kalman filter ha helps me to find the real control and then you just, this goes into the plane and tells you where it should go. But this, this is some kind of noise also, and it will not do it per perfectly, but still you measure it and you have a chance to control yourself again. So this is kind of the idea that's been used in engineering and it's been extremely useful. And again, as I said, auto, this is really autopilot over here. The mathematics has been done and, and calculations have been done. So what are the solution techniques? How do I solve this optimal control problems? I have only shown you deterministic control problems. And in fact, much more exciting is the stochastic optimal control problems. I will talk about it later. So there are two solution techniques. One is if you want to optimize, you set the derivative equal to zero. And that's what they did. I mean, this is a it's a functional of some sort in a little bit more complex space than a Euclidean space. So you write it appropriately, you take its derivative, do some integration by parts, and you get something called Pontryagin maximum principle. As I said, during the moon landing problem, uh, both the Soviet Union and the United States were working very heavily on that. And Pontryagin is a very, uh, I mean, he's a well-known mathematician and he took interest in this problem and the maximum principle, it's not just simply derivative equal to zero, do you have to do, put it into a nice form? And it is, it is a sufficient condition. It looks very much like an earlier Lagrange equation in mechanics. 
you know, I mean, it's a, if you have a candidate uh, as a solution, I mean, you can check whether it is satisfying or not, but it doesn't guarantee that things are optimal. It is, it has limitations, but when it works, it is much, uh, it's very powerful. So this is the first thing. The other thing is a little bit more sophisticated and that's where I will spend most of my time during the remainder of the uh, talk. It's called dynamic programming. Dynamic programming not only applies to optimal control, but it's a very uh, uh, nice tool that applies to a lot of things. And it was, it is generally uh, attributed to Richard Bellman and it is very much like the Jacobi method in, uh, in calculus of mechanics. Uh, uh, classical mechanics. And the other thing that, uh, that comes out that it has a nice connection to partial differential equations, nonlinear partial differential equations. Uh, even if your system is linear, like the one I did, linear quadratic regulator, there will be some nonlinearity, quadratic nonlinearity. Uh, and it, the object that solves the partial differential equation is the best value, that's known as the value function. So if you're at a point, at a state, and you ask, what is the best uh, value that I can get? And that particular thing is a function of the state solves a nonlinear differential equation. And I will outline this thing so it will be less uh, mysterious, uh, I hope, uh, in 10, 15 minutes. So this is, this, is the, uh, this is the key method that I'm going to uh, outline. Uh, again, Bellman is Richard Bellman has been uh, given credit for this, but let me also mention Bellman only did the uh, deterministic control, uh, optimal control, stochastic optimal control, in fact, is due to many other people, including my uh, advisor, Wendell Fleming, he's been central, and Harold Kushner, again, uh, they were much more important figures establishing dynamic programming equations in the stochastic case. So the main idea is the following. So forget, I'm, I'm not taking derivative right now. I'm just telling you how dynamic programming works. The main idea is the following. This is a, this is a uh, dynamic problem. So things are going to evolve in time. And at that time, you're trying to decide on an action. So, the, 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 and you're trying to minimize the cost. For example, the uh, time to, uh, so for example, in the linear quadratic uh, regulator, you want to minimize the uh, square of the state and square of the control. So there are two things in, at play over here is that there is one is the immediate cost of your, your action. For example, in the case of the linear quadratic regulator, uh, it is x squared plus alpha squared. You want to make alphas as small as possible. So the example over here where I'm saying is that if L x uh, alpha is equal to some x squared plus alpha squared. So this one means try to minimize, minimize alpha squared, which means that you're trying to make alpha equal to zero. But if you make alpha equal to zero, uh, then the state is, if you remember, x dot is equal to ax plus b alpha. Now, in this case, alpha is zero, so you're not controlling. The system is evolving as it is. For example, if A order that I have written and disappeared is zero, then you won't go anywhere. So that's not good, okay. So the, the point over here is that this part over here is trying to force you to make alpha equal to zero, but you want to go, you don't want to be where you are maybe. Maybe your X is too large and you want to decrease that. So, and how do you do that? Uh, the first thing is the, the immediate cost. That's generally in a mathematical formulation, it is known. In the modern reinforcement learning techniques, it is not known, but I learn it by interacting with, this, with the environment. Now, the other thing is the more interesting thing is that if I use a control, it, I'm at point X and I use a control, it takes me some other place. So you say that, okay, is it a good place to go or not? The way to record that one is the value function. The best value that you will get at every point, if you know that, then you, will, you have a way to assess the place you go is good or bad. Right, so that is why V is important. And this idea of assessing your position through value function or some other function is, is central in, in the reinforcement learning and in particular Q learning that I will try to mention uh, towards the end of the talk. 
So that is the idea. That is, but this is like life, right? I mean, I want to eat a lot of uh, baklava, but that's not good for me in the future. So you have to do uh, the, 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 I mean, everybody has its own balance over there. That's exactly what optimal control is forcing you to do. So let me just at least do a little bit of mathematics and show you what this, how these equations are obtained. So I'm going to remind you or recall you what the optimal control problem is in the specific case of a minimum time problem. Again, I'm not doing optimal stochastic, stochastic problems because that would require a little bit more knowledge about uh, Brownian motion and all that, and I don't want to get into that. This is very simple. It's just simple, ordinary differential equations. I have, uh, I have a controlled state, which is uh, solving this uh, ordinary differential equations. If you make enough assumptions, it has a unique solution. Then the cost is going to be some kind of a, so this is, uh, I said minimum time problem, but I could take, think about this one as one, and then it becomes really the minimum time problem. But you can put a uh, L over there if you want. And the value function is the best value that you can get. Or if L is equal to, so let's take L equal to one, then V would be the smallest time that, uh, that you need to go from X to wherever you're going. So this is, I'm trying to go from, so I have X over here and I have a region called T over here and I'm trying to go somehow to here. And I want to do it in, in the smallest possible time and VX is gonna be the, the minimum time. And again, let me just throw this one that is X over here. If X is close to the target, then of course it takes me less time so it is a function of this state, I mean, that's very clear. And I want to, maybe you're interested only, so suppose that I'm interested in calculating the, uh, the control exactly at this point, but to be able to do that, you, it is useful to compute the uh, minimal time function or the value function at every point. So that is one observation. So. Now, this is how the dynamic programming goes. This, this page has at least two mathematical errors in it, but overall it, is, it becomes rigorous at the end. So what does it say? So, so I just start over here, the V over here, the value function is the minimum of that. And that is the definition of what J is. So the first line over here is just definition. That's, that is rigorous. <laughs> the second one over here, what I do is that I write L, the integral, I'm sorry, the integral of L, uh, in two pieces, I just go from zero to H, from H to the stop, uh, the entrance time or, or the hitting time, tau. So that's again, just split the integrals. There is nothing wrong about that. Then over here, this is the first step that requires proof, in fact. So I look at this part over here. I say that, look, I'm trying to minimize uh, the whole thing by using alpha. Now, if I look at, or if I concentrate my effort only the alphas after H, time H, and then do the right thing over there, the best thing I can get over here will be the value function, but at the point not uh, X, original X, but what this control alpha will take me at time H. So there is a little bit of a, uh, you're minimizing over alpha, but the values of alpha from zero to H is fixed. And then you, you just vary the other part from H to part on. So this part requires proofs in the deterministic optimal control. It is a simple measure. I mean, it is rather easy, uh, not very detailed. In, in stochastic optimal control, on the other hand, requires quite a bit of uh, work, which has been done in the, in the past decades. So this, this is called dynamic uh, programming principle. And it has to be proved. Generally, in optimal control, we really want that. But the next one over here, this is not, it looks uh, formal, but that is okay, right? I mean, if L is continuous in its variables, it would be looking like L X alpha zero. So you just simply approximate this integral by that. H is supposed to be small. Now, 
from this point on, what I do is that to go from here to there is a, a informal statement and it's incorrect, uh, which is it's, it's, it assumes that V is a differentiable function. And then just simply, this is calculus, uh, simple calculus. If V is differentiable, but in most applications, V is not differentiable, but nevertheless, I'll just go ahead and do it. So this is just chain rule. Then I do the same, okay, what did I do here? Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Here, this, from here to there is rigorous because I'm just using the fact that the derivative of X is equal to F, there is nothing wrong. And I took this uh, V and I took it out. So, uh, so this step is okay. And then again, I do, I just look at the integral and I say that it is small. I mean, I just write it, what I did right here to go from here to there, I do the same thing here. And then what is left is the following. Vx, I started with Vx, is equal, approximately equal to Vx, a small uh, constant h times something over here. So Vs cancel each other, obviously. V cancels it, h is not important. So the thing that is red over here or violet, in fact, I don't use red anymore. Uh, violet over there, the term in violet has to be zero. Okay. This, is, this is the derivation of uh, this being equal to zero. This is the dynamic programming equation. But this was dynamic programming principle. From dynamic programming uh, principle to dynamic programming equation, you can go formally rather easily, but this differentiability of V is a serious uh, problem. Because V is an implicitly defined function, I don't know what regularity it has. So this is where the viscosity solutions came in, in the late 80s and early 90s, and that is now very well understood. Uh, so everything over here is formal, as I said, but everything made rigorous, it's uh, in some uh, quite generality, but it's very, very general. So. Now, let's, let me continue formally. That, that gives you a lot of ideas. So this is the dynamic programming equation. This is the one that I'm taking from the previous thing. It is in the particular case of the minimal time problem, but every optimal control problem, if you follow the steps that I have shown you, you get some kind of an equation. That would be different, but there will be some equation. So this is my dynamic programming equation. And the important thing over here is, I'm not really interested in the value. I'm interested in the control. How do I go from one place to another? What do I do? What happens over here is that this minimization over here, if you fix X, the state, then this is just a, a you know, regular uh, optimization problem. So you find the best alpha from here. So, so you look at alpha star X, which maximizes or, or minimizes, obviously, in my equation over here, uh, minimizes. And that is a function of X. And then what you do is that if you look at, you remember X dot is equal to F of X T and alpha T. So instead of using alpha T, I just use, uh, look at this equation, time derivative of a function F of X star, T, alpha star X star T. If you look at this equation, this ODE, if you happen to be able to solve this, OD, that would be your optimal uh, state. So that is how you solve the problems. A lot of, again, formalities that technically everything is wrong. And in this case, you may not be able to make them rigorous either, but that is the idea. But, but in some problems like linear, quadratic, regulatory, it works very well. I mean, uh, there are cases where it works, but in general, it's not going to work. Maybe I take a, a breath and then ask whether there is any questions. Okay, let me continue. Now, up until our, everything is deterministic, so let me introduce at least some stochastic control. And the easiest way I'm doing is that this in this setting, the Markov decision problem. So if you look at the Markov decision problem, it's a simple setup. As I said, I'm trying to make the, the theory understandable to by everybody. So this is the simplest structure that you can think. So I have a state space, which is gonna be finite right now. In all our previous examples, the state space was a Euclidean space. Now I take a finite set and I have a finite action space also. I can use, I can go right, left, uh, up and down, maybe. just something like that. Now, when you choose, uh, when you're at this, suppose that you're at, at the point X and you just choose an action, then 
the next place that you go to is going to be not deterministic, like in the previous case, but it's going to be probabilistic. You stand, so from X, once you use A, so if you, with the state action pair X comma A, you move to A with probability P X Y. And that also gives you a cost or reward depending on the problem of R. Right. So P, T, X, Y, uh, this one over here, the, this is probability of going from X to Y if A is used and at time T. So generally uh, we are at time, it may not be time homogeneous either. So we have a function like that. So this is the probability that the next step is equal to Y, current state is X and uh, control is A and you're at time T. So this is called the probability, the uh, transition probabilities and a Markov uh, process, this is a controlled Markov process, is completely determined by this function P. Of course, they have to add up to, I mean, they have to have obvious properties uh, for that to happen. So what happens is that I give myself an action sequence and then create a, a Markov decision uh, process or, or a Markov process, controlled Markov process. Now, this is, this is the first definition, adapted processes. Now, as opposed to deterministic ones, uh, in stochastic control, information is important. So you should not use information that is coming in the future. In deterministic cases, everything is no, everything is deterministic. I know where I'm gonna be in the future, but in this thing, I don't. So therefore I need to introduce this notion of adaptiveness and there is some kind of a, a information accumulated up to time T and your controls can only use that information. It's a beautiful structure from analysis. You use it by sigma algebras and filtrations, and that is really very standard in uh, probability, but it's really uh, beautiful uh, with the insight. So then what you saw, so I only use adapted controls, and if you have adapted controls, maybe this, this part is not so important. For every adapted control, there is a nice uh, Markov process that goes with it. What I want to do is I want to use not adapted controls, but a special subset of adapted controls, which are called feedback controls. In fact, up until now, everything that I have done was an, a, a feedback control. A feedback control is, doesn't use all the information up to the accumulated up to now, but it uses only the location you're at. So it is a function of the state only. Of course, time is state, so you can use state as well. So feedback would be, you look at where you are and you decide what you're going to do. You don't care, you don't have any memory. And this structure is, is uh, everything I'm doing is a Markov process. Markov means uh, the state itself doesn't need to know what happened in the past. Therefore, this type of controls, feedback controls, which is a subset, strict subset of adapted controls, is, is uh, contains an optimal process. So the lemma over here is sufficient to control feedbacks, and then we only use look at by, by feedbacks. And the proof is simple. It is just a Markov, Markov structure. Now let me do this. So I'm doing the problem now properly. So I have done everything discrete, so why not discretize the time as well? In fact, Markov chain is time. Uh, so what I do is that I take a, a uh, function. So this is going to be a cost, cost function, which is a function of the state and the control. And you, I want to add them up going into the future and take expected value. Now, going into the future, the problem is uh, it's an infinite sum, right? I mean, so you take a row here which is called the discount factor, which is less than one. So it makes sure that this thing is summable. And then the Markov decision problem is to find the best alpha that minimizes this function J. And there is an opt um, there is a dynamic programming works very well for this problem. And, and let me write down the dynamic programming. Uh, and, and in fact, there is no dynamic programming principle and equation are the same here in continuous standard chance. So, so you start, so the value function over here, V, uh, is equal to, uh, in fact, it is equal to rho times, okay, there's the immediate cost and what happens after the next step. After the next step is you take expected value of uh, Vx1, but X1 depends on the control and in fact, it depends on where you are as well. And then, but things are in the future are discounted by rho. So that is, the, this one is dynamic programming principle, but rather uh, 
it is not too difficult to prove here either. I can just write this expected value just like that. So this is the expected value written. So you can write it like that if you want. If L is coming from a, uh, it has this structure, you can write it in this way. So they are all rewriting the same thing. But let me rewrite it in the following way. Uh, v is equal to infimum of a function qxa. This is the q function that is used centrally in, in q learning. That's why I want to introduce. So, uh, so q function over here is exactly that. Q is a function of the state action pair, and it is given like that, but it has V in it. But you can write this one. This one is V is infimum or minimum over Q. So the box equation over here, this box equation over here is in fact the uh, equation for Q, if you want. Either you think of this equation as a function of V, that is, uh, as an equation for V, or this one over here is an equation for Q. Knowing Q, is the same as knowing V. In the reinforcement learning, you want to learn Q for, for things that are uh, maybe not that easy to convey in three minutes, but that is, that is the dynamic programming equation for a Markov uh, controlled Markov chain. So again, this Q is very important. And if you can solve this one, I mean, numerically, if you know everything, if you know P, R, everything, this is not difficult to solve numerically in a machine. Of course, if the number of states is 10 to the 16, that might be difficult, but, but a reasonable number of states, that's not a difficult thing to solve numerically. And, but what happens is that, let me just show you two applications and close in. And, and in fact, I don't know whether I have that much time. Uh, Q, Q learning is, is the off, uh, offshoot of this, this uh, dynamic programming that I showed you. In Q learning, so you rewrite this equation that I had before. So this is a, you think of this one as a function, uh, as an equation for Q and P is the transition, uh, transition probability and R is the cost. So let's say that we are trying to minimize. So in Q learning, uh, uh, we think that we do not know P and we do not know R. So I'm trying to learn them. And how do you learn them? So what you do is that if you don't know P, the transition matrix. So please note that I didn't, uh, I'm taking the transition probability and cost as uh, homogeneous, time homogeneous. So I'm trying, if I want to learn a probability, what do I do? If I want to, if you want to learn the probability of an event, you try to you repeat it uh, independently many, many times and you see how often it's occurring and that's your probability. So what, in a way, you interact with the environment. So if you want to learn the probability of something, you have to observe that event or try to observe that event many, many times. And Q learning does that. So I'm trying to learn Q and R, and I'm going to experiment. So this is how uh, Q learning, uh, this is called temporal difference algorithms. Uh, the Q algorithm that I'm going to talk was developed by Chris Watts, Watson, Watkins, and he is really not a mathematician. I mean, he, he was coming from social sciences. Now it tries to compute, this algorithm tries to compute Q, but it has gone beyond that. So the Q function is telling me how good a certain state pair Q, X and A is. Uh, and we don't know that. And once you know Q, then you can do your control problem really well, because if, if you know the best Q over there, you just simply choose the best control given the Q. So that is called exploitation. If given a Q function, I can exploit this function and choose the best action. But you're, not, you're never sure to have the best Q function. So to learn the Q functions, you need to explore the environment. That is like trying to learn the probabilities and the rewards. So that is, that is the idea you explore to learn the Q function. And if you're, sh and then, once you get better and better Q functions, you exploit it. And that is exactly the Q function. This structure is always in reinforcement learning. That is, a, that is crucial. And it is crucial that it is the value function is a function of X, but Q is a function of X and the control. And this, this, this very subtle difference made a huge difference in fact in the learning uh, uh, context. So the algorithm, I can even write this thing so you initialize the Q function. You initialize the Q. Q is what I'm trying to find. 
And then you just keep repeating what I just said. Let's suppose that I know I just updated Q to QN and XN is observed. Then once you, once you observe uh, XN, you choose the QN from a policy. So generally you look at the Q function and choose the best one. And once in a while you put some kind of an epsilon greedy structure to it. And then you let you, so now then you, you have observed XN and you have uh, chosen a n and you let the environment choose the next step and the cost. And this is being done through this uh, probability density. If you know it in a machine computer, you can just implement it. If you don't know it, you have to interact with the environment to know that one. And then you update Q by this one, because you remember Q is, uh, this is supposed to be zero. So that is a very natural thing to write. And this, if you know P, you can go to the machine and implement this one, it works. And I've done this for undergraduate students and it is not a thing, but if you don't know the P, you just interact with the, the environment and that's gonna learn. And that is essential. That this is ground zero in learning, but of course they have done many more things, many more interesting things afterwards. So let me, uh, there are a lot of extensions and I'm running out of time. So let me not get into that. Uh, a lot of, I mean, this, extremely uh, active area and it's just give you this uh, lecture zero in, in Q learning. But it's got, comes from optimal control. That's what I was trying to say. In the very uh, uh, last minutes, let me show you that the nonlinear partial differential equations of the type that I'm writing there can be, uh, can be analyzed by using control or maybe differential games and it goes under the name of viscosity solutions. It goes back to 90s. I was involved with that. So there's a little picture that we were, we were really young. Uh, this is Pierre Lee Lyons is here. Uh, this is Pierre Lee Lyons. This is Taki Suganidis, Benoit Pertam, Boz and myself, and Crandall, Ishii, and Evans. So these are in the seven, this was in 1987. So we developed these things and it's been very useful to discuss the solutions. Say that, okay. What is going on? I mean, I think this is old stuff. <laughs> I like the old stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. And it's very, it has been remarkably powerful. What is going nowadays, we can do now, use viscosity solutions and the type of things that I have talked about in very, very high dimensions. When I say high dimensions, I'm, for example, this paper that I have done with my students, Repen and uh, Tissot again, is, is, is in, we could go up to 100 and we could go beyond that. And you said that, okay, you're doing 500. How do you know it is, it is correct? But if you take a special benchmark problems, you have some, some guarantees and we know that we're calculating properly. So let me show you one picture. For example, this would be very hard to do in 2000, 20 years ago. This is a certain free boundary that we could calculate. Uh, in 19, uh, 2000, there are papers, important papers exactly showing this picture. This is two dimension. We could do this thing in 100 dimension now. So it is very useful. And a lot of the stuff that I have told you, which didn't show you the details, but is very, very central to these calculations. And finally, for example, discuss these solutions has been completely settled in finite dimensional spaces. But if you go to the infinite dimensional spaces, like the classical place to go is the space of probability measures or Wasserstein spaces, the equations of this type are infinite dimensional equations coming from a, a optimal control problem in infinite dimensions. You want to know how to solve this equation. There are many things that you want to ask about this equation. For example, what is the meaning of a solution? How can we calculate them? Uh, how do they relate to this very, very uh, important class of problems, the optimal transport problems? And there are many applications coming from infield games. It is a very active area of research. And there is a very recent paper, not a paper, it is a, such a long paper that they turn it into a book and published by the Annals of Mathematics by Cardelegue, De La Rue, Las Rue Lyons. Very nice approach. I want to mention that by Erhan and his collaborator Asaf Cohen from Michigan, they take X to be a finite set. That is a very, very incredibly beautiful observation because if X is finite, the set of probability measures is, is a Euclidean space, okay, subset of a Euclidean space. It's finite dimensional, so you can do many things with it. And this really understand the problem. This paper, this book, as beautiful as it is, it is highly technical, but if you come to here, you understand the thing. So 
That is why there are a number of things going on. And, and as with a student of mine, Jinxin Yan, we're looking at some Wasserstein type metrics, which is related to what Erhan done in a different context as well. So there is a lot of interesting research going on, uh, still going on in optimal control. So let me, I think I'm right on time. I, maybe I just took um, uh, too much time, but uh, there are a lot of things going on. Uh, for example, I mentioned over here the contract theory. Contract theory uses a lot of stochastic optimal control. Uh, and this is just recently getting the Nobel prizes. Uh, so it's an important thing. And let me just finish by this quote by Walter that, that stochastic control is really important because I don't know anything deterministic anymore. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mete, for a great talk. Any questions? have to raise our hands to ask a question, but I took the liberty of clicking the mute. I'll make myself seen too, I guess. Now, Mete, uh, I have been around all sorts of people who do optimal uh, control. Is dynamic uh, programming, is the algorithmic complementary version of uh, optimal control, or are they used uh, as synonyms, or are they? How do you distinguish? Uh, if you have, a, I mean, in most of the engineering applications, optimal or <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 optimal control is uh, in in engineering applications the Markovian structure. And if you're Markovian, then dynamic programming holds. So it is a it's a solution technique to to optimal control problems. Okay. And optimal control has to have a Markov structure so that I can use dynamic programming. It may look not look to have a Markov structure, but you kind of do extensions and all that and turn it into that. So dynamic programming is a powerful uh, solution technique, I would say. Okay. But that is the the one that I've been using all my life, and and it and then it extends to many other things. Dynamic programming also applies to other types of problems, like you know, like knapsack problems. I mean, sometimes very unexpected. Uh, problems because the way that I'm showing you that it has a temporal structure to it, but it has dynamic program doesn't need uh, exactly a temporal structure. It should have a variable looks like a temporal uh, variable. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Other questions? There's no other question. I'll ask. I had a second question. Is the stock market a Markovian process, or uh, do you use uh, ideas from the past to predict the future? I think you should ask him about that question. I don't know. Uh, he doesn't have your sophistication. <laughs> but he has the wisdom, though. <laughs> okay. I mean, I have stock price processes, most likely not Markov. I mean, uh, it has a lot of momentum built into that. But the, the key thing is that if you take only the stock price, it certainly is not uh, Markov. But then there are, you add other things. This is the, the usual thing that they do. Okay, if it is not Markov, let's put something else like volatility and then that make, make it good. So, and then you, you take uh, the stock prices from the past, somehow you try to build the momentum. So if you add enough uh, variables, then it may become a Markov. But the recent thing to say is that you let the uh, machines find the right uh, features and then it becomes Markov. I mean, you can do really up uh, learning algorithms on this thing to learn the features, which ones are relevant. And then with those variables, it might be Markov. But it is a, it's a million, not a million, a billion dollar question probably. No, to have the right uh, dynamic or good model for stock price processes is very hard. I'll tell Kemal that you mentioned his name. <laughs> Probably. By the way, Kemal is my, is my son who is in, on the advisory board to the, the uh, Orphan Orphe. department. I'll uh, then have a question. Uh, I have a comment. 
knowing Mete for a very long time. <laughs> uh, don't be fooled by the simplicity of his talk. These things are extremely technical. He's hiding it. He's fooling you. He makes things look so simple. And it is his, uh, the, one of the, his virtues, wizardies, uh, I would say. <laughs> uh, it's a very technical field. Very good talk, Mete. I also Thank have you. one comment uh, about a paper of Prager I might have mentioned uh, that appeared in Quarterly Journal of uh, Mathematics in the 1970s, Future of Mathematics. Uh, Prager also uses the Brecker-Strom problem and mm -hmm. approaches it numerically and makes wonders with it. So it seems this is a, a problem that uh, aesthetically is very pleasing and, uh, and easy to describe. Not easy to solve maybe, but easy to describe. Thanks, for, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. It's good seeing you. Yeah, we know each other a long time, right? In 1984, <laughs> taking classes together. Uh, Mete, I told Ali, Ali Hoca that you mentioned him. I sent him a screenshot of your <laughs> page without asking yeah, you. I, I think was there. You were taking questions. Yeah, that's why I'm saying it now. Other questions? Uh, 